All right, well, uh, you missed something. And I can't back, go back and, and cover that ground. But you, uh, you missed something tonight, and we're going to kind of pick up uh, where we left off on that. And we've been looking at the Sermon of the, on the Mount in the book of Matthew. So I want you to turn again tonight to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And if you would, stand with me. Matthew chapter 7. Let's read the, the chapter. And remember now, this is still part of the Sermon on the Mount. And that's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Not the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of heaven. It's not talking about the church, though we can find uh, some... Uh, instruction for correction and some instruction for righteousness sake uh, but this is uh, before the new birth is ever mentioned this is before the church this is entirely a Jewish gathering there are no Gentiles here uh, Jesus is talking to Jews and uh, so we know the background Verse 1 said, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why ever holdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Now, these next few verses are dealing as well with verse number 1 and verse number 2 about judgment. And we covered... Uh, that fact about judgment last week, and so if you weren't here, you need to get it and uh, talk about uh, the fool and some of the other things and, and uh, how we've been wrongly taught about that in the church age. The Bible said in verse 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, verse 6 through the remainder of the chapter, watch it very closely. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? Now, uh, just in case I, I don't come back and cover this particular ground in verse 7 and 8, friend, remember we are talking about the kingdom of heaven. And that's what the nation of Israel is supposed to be seeking after right now is the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Verse 9. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven good, good, give good things to them that ask Him? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And so we realize that the law and the prophets will also be instituted during the kingdom of heaven. Verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. So a good prophet will bring forth good fruit. A good teacher will bring forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree or a, per corrupt, a false prophet I bringeth forth evil fruit. 
A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Well, we know where them false prophets are headed. Yeah. Amen. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Alright, now, we will get to this after a while. But I want you to know this. It's not talking about heaven. We've been preached these verses of Scripture about heaven all of our lives. This is not talking about heaven. It's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Uh-oh. Wow. He that doeth the will of my Father? Well, that sounds like there's some works involved with this crowd. Yep. Would you say amen right there? Amen. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Guess where they'll depart to? Yeah. They'll depart to the fire. Yeah. Verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine. Now, these sayings are talking about what? Come on. What are all these sayings about? Be at Kingdom of heaven. Okay? Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken them unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell down, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. Now, notice now, we're talking about doing and not doing. Okay? Everyone that heareth these things of mine and doeth it not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his what? Alright, so the, Be the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount is doctrine. And it is doctrine concerning the second advent and the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But Christ also knowing that Israel is going to reject Him, there's also some things added in here concerning Israel and the tribulation period because of their rejection. That's going to come. Verse 29. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, y'all do realize the scribes are the ones that were supposed to be pinning down the scriptures. So there was a problem with the scribes, even in Christ's day, concerning the perversion of scriptures. And when perversion of scriptures is in place, then folks are without authority. Yeah. But the authority himself is now on the scene. Amen. Let's pray and then you can be seated tonight. Pray with me. <coughs> Lord, as we bow in divine presence, again, we certainly thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings of life. And Lord, we thank you that we have this privilege of being back in the house of God. And Lord, I just ask you now that you'd illuminate my mind and God, that you'd anoint these fleshly bits of clay and God, that you'd lead me tonight in the direction that you'd have me to go. And Father, help tonight as we examine the Scriptures and Father, as we compare Scripture with Scripture tonight, I, I certainly pray that God, you'll open our hearts and Father, help us to be receptive to the truth tonight. I, I, 
Father, you said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I, I'm so glad tonight for the truth. And Lord, I thank you, dear God, for how it does make us free. And God sets us free from philosophies of men and from traditions of men and from their theology instead of the theology of God. I just thank you tonight that we can come and Lord, we can rejoice in the truth. I pray now tonight, God, that if there be a hindering spirit in our midst, I pray that you'll bind it and remove it far from this place. But help us tonight, dear God, that have gathered together. I trust that we're here with the right mind and the right motive. And Father, that we truly want to learn the Scripture. And Father, let the Scripture be the help and the blessing that we so stand in need of in these days. Help us now, Lord. I thank you. I praise you because I love you. To ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, go ahead and be seated right here tonight. And if you got anything to put in the roof and jug, you can do that after service tonight. Look with me again tonight in verse number 6 now. And keep in mind, we are still talking about the kingdom of heaven. That earthly kingdom, that millennial kingdom. And uh, you and I know that we're in this transitional book of Matthew. And we know that here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the earthly ministry of, of Jesus, uh, uh, that here is the first time uh, uh, since way back uh, uh, in the book of Genesis, since God is, is bringing uh, uh, a relationship again between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and He is going to offer both to the nation of Israel uh, uh, before this thing is through. And that's what He's talking about is the kingdom of heaven right now. So look with me, if you will, please, in verse number 6. We've already covered a lot of these verses. But look with me in verse number 6. The Bible said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again, and rend you. Now, before we examine that verse of Scripture, uh, uh, we've got to read a few more because your Bible is self-defining. The Bible said in verse number 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Uh, I seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Uh, now, we realize that here, just as John, when he came out of the wilderness, he was preaching, uh, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, uh, Jesus is offering to them the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and he's telling them uh, uh, that you can ask, and you'll find. And, uh, uh, and, and then he goes on in verse number 8, for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. But then he's going to add some things to this. Look at verse number 9 closely. Or what man, or ties these verses together, or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? So with all of these verses collectively placed together, I, verse 6, you can go back and you can find the understanding I, when we do a little searching of the Scripture. I, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, I, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. I, in verse 9, then he talks about his son. I, not God's son, but a man's son. I, and then in verse number 11, it talks about your children. I, and so if you want to understand verse number 6. I, I we're going to go to one of the general epistles. We were there last Wednesday night. We'll go back there again tonight. And then when you find it, you want to hold your place there for a while. Uh, or mark it because we will be going back. We go back to 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter number 2. Now one of the things that I want you to understand about a pearl is this. That a pearl is, uh, uh, it becomes something very costly and, and worth a great deal, but it comes from something that is foreign to the inside of that oyster shell. And so it's a grain of sand or it's a broken piece of shell. And it's something that should have never been placed there to start with. It's foreign matter. 
For you to understand where we're fixing to go and what Jesus is talking about, you have to just be thinking of, of what, uh, the, uh, what the psalmist David said. I, he said, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In the garden before the fall, friend, sin was a foreign object. Sin was never meant to be placed in the garden. Okay? Amen. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So in verse 6 of our text, it says, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So over here in 2 Peter chapter number 2, if you will, first of all, look at verse number 14. And here it's talking about the false prophets and the false teachers in the tribulation period. Now that's one of the things that you've got to understand. We can find a lot of parallel out of 2 Peter uh, concerning the church. Uh, but 2 Peter is a general epistle uh, and it's written mostly to those that are in the tribulation period. This is a doctrinal book for those in the tribulation period. Amen. And so here uh, in verse number 14 you find this. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. Well, you are an unstable soul if you cast your pearls before the swine and if you give those holy things to dogs. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practice, cursed children. The pearls back in chapter number 7 of the book of Matthew is the children. No. In verse number 22, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And so Jesus is warning the house of Israel back here in chapter number 7. And even in that present day, friend, listen, how the scribes how were false in their doctrine, the Pharisees were false in their doctrine, the Sadducees were false in their doctrine. And when it came especially to the Pharisees, they taught the traditions of their fathers instead of the Word of God. And they taught those traditions for the doctrine of Scripture. We Amen. see that as we go on and study. And so Jesus is warning these adults here, uh, uh, friend, you can find the kingdom of heaven, you can become a part of the kingdom of heaven, uh, and so can your children if you do not cast your children uh, at the feet of these swine, these false teachers. Amen? Amen. And uh, then that's has to do with the asking and the receiving and, and all of that business. And we could look at some more, but I think you can get the gist of that. In verse number 12, then notice what the Bible said. Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And so God is reminding them that the law and the prophets are in effect during the course of the millennial kingdom. And these are additions, friend, to that to Moses' law. And you and I know, friend, listen, the temple is going to be rebuilt in the kingdom. And we read some of that concerning in the house of prayer and all nations coming there and bringing their sacrifices. Uh, we read that previously. But now watch verse number 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in their act. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We've been taught all of our lives that these verses of Scripture are talking about heaven and hell. They are not talking about heaven and hell, friend. In verse 13, the context is still entering in uh, to the kingdom of heaven, and it said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. Can I tell you, friend, uh, that if you live according to the law and the prophets, uh, and if your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, as he declares that it must, uh, then you're going to find that in that millennial kingdom, friend, uh, it's a straight gate. It's a straight gate to get into the millennial kingdom. And friend, at the end, 
when it ends in apostasy, it's as well a narrow and a straight gate whenever Satan is loose for that little season. And those apostates in that millennial reign follows him and begins to encamp around Jerusalem all over again. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. Look, we don't have time to search all the scriptures tonight, but first of all, let's go back to Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. We've learned in the past about the remnant, and don't want to get ahead of myself tonight because you find the remnant of the house of Israel in this text. Zechariah chapter 13. The Bible said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Listen. At the end of the tribulation period, whenever you have the judgment of the nations, there's going to be a straight gate. There's going to be a wide gate. That straight gate's going to be narrow. The majority are not going into the kingdom of heaven. And the majority of Israel is not going into the kingdom of heaven because all Jews are not going to receive the truth in the tribulation period. Now before we read these verses, I want you to keep something in mind. When the church is raptured out and the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's just that. He's going to pose himself as the Messiah, as Christ. And the kingdom that he is going to usher in is going to be a pseudo-millennium. That means it's going to be a false kingdom of heaven. Yeah. The world is going to immediately receive him as the Christ and they're going to accept His throne and His kingdom as the kingdom of heaven that's been taught in the Word of God. And the first three and a half years are going to be three and a half years of peace. Because He's supposed to be the Prince of Peace. Okay? But anyway, watch now in Zechariah chapter 13. Look at verse number 8 and verse number 9 with me. Or look at verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. And against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Now his shepherd here is the Antichrist. You find that comparing Scripture with Scripture. God uses the Antichrist in the tribulation period. In verse 8, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, Two parts therein shall be cut off and die. This is at the revelation. This is at the second advent of Jesus Christ. This is at the end of the tribulation period. So broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Two thirds are going to be cut off and die. But the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. Two thirds of the Jews that enter into the tribulation period are not going to make it to go into the kingdom. Only one third. That's your remnant. Okay. Now go a little bit further. Look at verse 15. All of these collectively go together. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now church, listen to me. Paul called Satan, or talks about Satan, how he is transformed into an angel of light. Well, in that pseudo kingdom of heaven, he is going to profess himself to be the light of the world. His ministers that are now transformed into ministers of righteousness in the tribulation period, they're going to be empowered to be able to do signs and wonders. Yeah. <clears throat> Y'all still follow me tonight? Amen. These are the false prophets. This is the crowd that Jesus is warning the, uh, the nation of Israel about. Look, all the signs and the wonders, all of these miracles uh, uh, recorded in the Old Testament, prophesied by the prophets, uh, these were the signs that the nation of Israel were to look forward to, uh, to be able to recognize who the Messiah truly was uh, and who His apostles would be uh, by them being given these powers. They're going to reject what they see over the next three years. But whenever the Antichrist comes on the scene, when the church is raptured out, friend, all of this stuff is going to take place again. Antichrist is going to set himself up as Christ. He's going to empower those that are his apostles. And they're going to do the signs and the wonders. They're going to cast out the devils and all of that stuff, friend. And two-thirds of the nation of Israel is going to believe them instead of believing the truth. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so y'all still with me? Right? Amen. Well, what would be a good place to start? Well, a good place to start would probably be... Let's go back to the book of Daniel. I don't have all this written down, but here's a good place to go. Go back to the book of Daniel, chapter number 11. Daniel, chapter number 11. Let's read a few things about the Antichrist. If we read a few things about the Antichrist, we'll know how that these false prophets are going to be uh, in power. Say amen when you find Daniel chapter 11. Look at verse 35. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. That time appointed is talking about that 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. And that is the tribulation period. In verse number 36, the Bible said, And the king. Now the king there talked about, here's the Antichrist. We don't have time to study all the way through the book of Daniel tonight. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. Who is that? That's Jehovah. Yeah. And shall prosper till the indignation. The indignation is the tribulation. The indignation is that time that is the wrath of God being poured out upon this earth. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is, it is determined shall be done. God's already determined it. This thing's not going to be turned around. Now notice verse 37, talking about the Antichrist. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Now back in the book of Isaiah, he's called the Syrian. And here, he's not going to regard the God of his fathers. What's that let us know? That knows that he's a Syrian Jew. The Antichrist will be a Syrian Jew. And then he goes on and says this. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. 
And that's talking about in the middle of the tribulation period when he's going to come in and he's going to break his covenant with the nation of Israel that he made it the first part of the tribulation period. He's going to set himself up in the temple in Jerusalem as God. He's going to offer uh, uh, the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke about uh, uh, instead of a lamb being offered and a lamb's blood being shed uh, and sprinkled on the mercy seat in that, in that holy place. Uh, he's going to slay a sow or a hog. He's going to slay a pig, that unclean animal, he's going to take that blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and that's the abomination of desolation. Amen. Now notice what it says right here in verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. A lot of things have been said about the desire of women. In Genesis part of the curse is that a woman's desire will be to her husband. But you have to keep something in mind here. You and I have to keep in mind the fact we're not talking to Gentiles and we're not talking to all the races of people. We're talking to a Jewish race. We're talking to Jewish people. And the desire of that Jewish woman has always been that she might bring forth a man child and that man child would be the son of the living God. That they would bring forth the Messiah. Neither will he regard the desire of women. What is the desire of that woman? The Messiah. Hold your place right here. Go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Another one of the general epistles. 1 John chapter 4. Look with me in verse number 1. Love, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You know who he's talking to? Literally, he's talking to those Jews in the middle or in the tribulation period. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. The desire of that Jewish woman is to bring forth into the world the Messiah. Who is the Messiah? It's God manifest in the flesh. So what's that tell us about Antichrist, the King? He doesn't regard Jesus Christ as God or as God manifest in the flesh. Look at the next verse, verse 3. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. That is what the king, the Antichrist, is confessing that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh. So he doesn't regard the desire of women. Notice what it goes on to say. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you heard that it should come and even now already is it in the world. You're of God, little children, and have overcome them. Who have they overcome? They've overcome those antichrists. Everybody that comes along and professes themselves to be a Christ is an antichrist. Amen. And it's not just going to be the antichrist in Jerusalem reigning during the tribulation period, but there's going to be a lot all over the planet, friend, that's going to be professing to be Christ. The Bible said this. Because greater is he that is in you. Than he that is in the world. They. Those antichrists. Are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world. And the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth. And the spirit of of error. Now did you notice the text here that didn't say that we are of Christ, it said we are of God. That puts you back in the same. Go back to the book of Daniel now, chapter number 11 again. Daniel chapter number 11. Verse 37 again said this, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. 
and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Now who's the God of horses? Antichrist. The king is Antichrist. Who's the God of horses? Who would his father be? Who is the God of forces? Who is the God of this present world? If he's the God of this world, then he's the God of forces. Satan. Satan. And his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Now, you have to understand, you have to go back and study the chapters leading up to this as well as comparing Scripture with Scripture and go back to Jeremiah and Isaiah and some of the minor prophets. And you have to realize, friend, everybody's not going to follow the Antichrist. Every kingdom is not going to be his kingdom. And right here it's talking about one of them in the king of the south. And that's a study for another night. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north, that's him, that's the king, the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. So when the king of the south begins to rise up against this king in the north who is the Antichrist, then the Antichrist is going to rise up with all of his power, and he's going to come against the king of the south like a whirlwind with chariots, and with horsemen, and with many ships. He shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land. And you do know what the glorious land is, don't you? That's the land of Palestine. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. There's three that's going to not succumb to the Antichrist in this nation. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He's going to gain Egypt. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. The tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Talking about Jerusalem. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. One well, end, there's no hope for him. But now to learn a little bit more about him. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Because we're talking about these false prophets that uh, is going to be in power. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. <coughs> Second Thessalonians chapter number 2. Look with me, begin in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. The day of Christ, friend, is talking about the revelation. And many had been deceived in the church of Thessalonica that it had already come. And they were in living in the tribulation period. And that's not so. The Bible said, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Boy, here's a wonderful study. Let me tell you who the Antichrist is going to be. It's going to be Judas Iscariot resurrected. Good study right there. Judas is going to be resurrected. That's why they're going to receive him, the Antichrist, as Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll, we'll do a study on that sometime. Who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God. See how this goes right along with Daniel chapter 11. 
or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we know right there in that verse that we are in the middle of the tribulation period. We are in that time of Jacob's trouble. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only who who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Who is that wicked? It's the Antichrist. It's the king back there in Daniel chapter number 11. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Judas resurrected is Satan incarnate in the flesh. Yeah. Now let me stop right there and say this. In case I've already lost some of you. Judas was a devil from the beginning. Yeah. Jesus purposely picked him. Jesus purposely gave him the same power that the other 11 apostles had. And for three years, Judas did exactly the same thing those other guys did. He cast out devils. He healed the sick. He caused the blind to see and the deaf to be able to hear and the dumb to be able to speak. He caused the lame to be able to walk. And the same power is going to be given to Satan's crowd in, in the tribulation period. Yeah. Amen. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and what? Lying wonders. Well, no wonder they're lying wonders because Satan was a liar and the father of it and he was a murderer from the beginning. This isn't weak anemic stuff I'm giving you tonight. Amen. Okay? This isn't what you get in the average fundamental Baptist church out of Matthew chapter 7. That's right. Amen? Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of, un of what? Unrighteous, oh my goodness. Righteousness, exceptual righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. So we're going to see what happens in the tribulation period. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They could have been saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. unrighteousness. Pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now he's talking to the church. This look what he's just dealt excuse me, what he's just dealt with has nothing to do with the church. Now go back to verse 8 for just a minute. You've got a pencil, write this down. Verse 8 said, when and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. I'm going to give you some chapters to look at to go along with this because we're not going to look at all this tonight. Malachi chapter 4 deals with this verse. Revelation chapter 19 deals with this verse. Isaiah chapter 63 Deals with this verse. Jeremiah chapter 25 deals with this verse. And Joel chapter 3 deals with this verse. And half a section in the book of Judges chapter number 5 deals with this verse. Now that's just a few. Alright, so y'all still with me? Amen. Alright, go back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. Now look again at the warning that Jesus gave these Jews in verse number 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. You know what's holy? Righteousness. And then He said, 
Uh, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Pearls are dealing with their children. Don't give righteousness to the dogs and don't cast your children to the swine. Okay? Why? Because the Bible said in verse 13, Either ye be at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Okay. Let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. Start reading with me in verse number 12. This is talking about the false prophets and the false teachers in the tribulation period. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not. And shall utterly perish in their own corruption. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. Well, you ought to be able to mark the fruits of these characters. Shouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, it shouldn't be a problem at all. If they can't cease from sin, and one of the sins that's being talked about here is adultery. That crowd's going to be an adulterous crowd. Now, we already see a lot of that going on, friend, in the precursor leading us up to the tribulation. Amen. Period. But that's because the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Yeah. We're seeing the birth pains leading to the tribulation period. And heart that have exercised with covetous practice curse children which have forsaken the right way. Now, they will curse the children, friend, because they'll, they'll curse the children to the point that they'll be the ones that I just read to you about out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Which have forsaken the what? Right way. Oh, the right way. What, what way is that? That's the straight. That's the narrow way. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who love the wages of unrighteousness. Well, let's stop right there for just a moment. Let's stay in the general epistles and let's go over to the book of Jude. The book of Jude. Okay. In Jude, look at verse 4. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What did they just do? First John chapter 4, what did they just do? Denying that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. What's that make this crap? Antichrist. 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 And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Who did He save out of Egypt? Who? The Jews. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of that great day. Even so Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also, here it is, these filthy dreamers, these false prophets, these false teachers, they're filthy dreamers. They defile the flesh. They despise the meaning and speak evil of dignity. Yet Michael the archangel, when continued with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. There's not really against him a railing accusation that said, The Lord rebuked thee. 
but these speak evil of those things which they know not. Can I tell you one of the things that crowd's not going to have a clue about what's going on? It's how that God is chastening the nation of Israel during the tribulation period and more especially the last half of that for the final time before He takes them into the kingdom of heaven. They're going to speak evil of those Jews just like man has been doing for 2,000 years. The Bible said this, They speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the game, saying of Korah. So here we find one that rejected and stood against Moses. And then we find another friend that uh, that was hired that they might, he might curse the nation of Israel, uh, but he wouldn't curse the nation of Israel. But because he loved filthy lucre, and for that gain, uh, he told the king exactly how he could get God to curse his people uh, uh, through fornication uh, and through the worshiping of idols uh, and by intermarrying uh, uh, with a nation that God told them to have nothing to do with. Amen. These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, crowds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, way, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Whence they come? Now we're at the end of the tribulation period. Now we're at the second advent. And who's with the Lord? Ten thousands of His saints. According to the book of Song of Solomon, the armies of the Lord. Why are we coming? To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them. That's that unrighteous crowd. Okay? Among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons and admonition because of advantage. But the love, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How did they talk? There should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own lusts. And so, there's another review of this crowd that Peter's talking about. Now go back to 2 Peter chapter 2 again. Let's finish it. Verse 16. You know what you can say about all false prophets and all false teachers is they're high ones. Yeah. Their teaching is for filthy lucre's sake. In verse 16, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice, for bad the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the what? Well, you know one of the things that they're going to, that them false prophets are going to preach? They're going to preach about receiving the mark of the beast. Yep. That's the allurement through the lust of the flesh. If you want to eat, you've got to have the mark. If you want to buy and sell and trade, you've got to have the mark. Amen. All these things tie in together. Through much oneness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, take the mark, you'll be free. No take the mark, you're dead. Yeah. Bow down to the image of the beast. You'll be free. See how all this applies as you go back and study those things in the book of Daniel? While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. 
And they're overcome certainly by the Antichrist. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. The way of righteousness. The way of righteousness. You get that? See how this begins to tie things together? Then, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her watering in the mire. Go over to the book of Revelation for just a minute. I wasn't going to put this in there, but I'll put it in there tonight. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Good show you that salvation is not going to be saying in the tribulation period as it is now. Revelation chapter 14, look at verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. What saints? The tribulation saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's works. Yeah. Plus Christ. Look back in chapter 12 and verse 17. This is talking about Israel. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. The woman is Israel. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's your remnant of Jews in the tribulation period. All right, let's go back to Matthew. Y'all still with me? Amen. I lost you yet? There's a whole lot more here. I ain't going to be able to cut it off. All right, look at verse 15 again. You wear a false... Now, you do realize that the false prophets are trying to get those in the tribulation period to take the broad way. Yep. Yeah. Now, keep something in mind. When we get into the millennium, there's going to be false prophets as well. You see, something you always have to keep in mind about the millennium is, even Christ being King of kings and Lord of lords, the way He has to rule all the way through the millennium is with a rod of iron. And then at the end, we know that when Satan is loose for a season, he's going to have a bunch of followers that's going to follow him try to take the kingdom away from, from Jesus. Yeah. It's going to end in apostasy just like every other dispensation has ended. And so you're going to have false teachers in the millennial as well. That will blow some fundamentals out of the water. <laughs> Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening fools. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Now look, hey, you and I in the dispensation of the church, you and I can backslide and bring forth bad fruit. But God's telling you something specific about the kingdom of heaven. This is part of what is to be looked for by those Jews. Verse 19 said, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So every false prophet is going to be hewn down and cast into the fire. Yeah. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. Now watch verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. So we know we've come to judgment now. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, that day of judgment, here's the judgment of the nations. Here's friend uh, uh, is after 
the Lord has come back in Revelation chapter 19 and the other chapters that I gave you and the Antichrist has been cast off into the hell and, and, or, or into that bottomless pit and, and just before the millennial begins we have this judgment and, and here's these false prophets going to be judged by Jesus. Because they're ministers of Satan transformed into ministers of righteousness. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. They say that this ain't talking about heaven, friend. This is talking about the millennium. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? So look, in verse 21, you have one crowd. And that's the crowd that did the will of his Father. Okay, but then in verse number 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that? So here we go. Here's the false prophets. The tribulation period. And in thy name have cast out devils. Oh, yes, you did. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. You remember them devils that told that one individual over in the book Acts that Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Yeah. Man. Mm -hmm. And then will I profess unto them I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon rock. Now he's still talking to Israel. And remember if you go back, when you look at Jehovah being at the potter, who does he call the clay? The house of Israel. We're not talking to Gentiles here. We're still talking to Jews. So now is where you're going to as well. When we went back in the book of Zech Zechariah chapter 13. Look at it. Therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. Back in Exodus chapter 15, their rock is not our, what? Now who's Moses talking about? Talking about Israel, after they came out of Egypt. Some of y'all look at my phone right here. Am I getting ahead of myself? The rain, now I'm going to take you to a verse. I'm going to clarify this now. Watch. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was found upon a rock. Do you know what he's telling these Jews right here? He's telling them, without telling them, you're not going to accept the kingdom of heaven right now. You're not going to accept me as Messiah. You're not going to accept me as King. And right now he's telling them about the tribulation period. And he's telling them exactly what's going to happen to the Jews in the tribulation period. The house of Israel. Notice verse 26. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not. See, there's the key. shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So one crowd builds on the rock. One crowd builds on the sand. One crowd builds on Jesus. One crowd builds on the Antichrist. Yeah. 
Go back to Isaiah chapter 43. Well, I, I better hope I'm getting this out the way you can understand it. Say amen when you get to Isaiah 43. Amen. All right, watch this, verse 1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O what? Yes, sir. Who's he talking to? Yes, sir. <laughs> Fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Now watch this. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba to thee. God's already told him back here in the book of Isaiah that remnant that's going to follow him and that remnant that's going to obey the truth and follow the will of his Father. He's already told him. You build on the rock, and when the winds and the rains, when the storms, that tribulation hour comes, that time of Jacob's trouble, I'm going to be with you. Amen. And then when you come out at the end, there's going to be a nation born in the day out of that remnant of the Jews. It's talked about right here. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Amen. Yeah. Okay? Now notice that as I close tonight, go back to Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 28. It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his what? This was contrary to what the Pharisees were teaching. This was contrary to what the false prophets were prophesying. And had been prophesying for years during Malachi and Matthew. And then it says in verse 29, For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Do you realize tonight, church, that this, this holds true from Christ's day and will hold true all the way through the tribulation period? As a whole, it was only a minority of Jews in those three and a half years of Christ's ministry that actually accepted Him as Messiah. The majority were the ones that cried and said, Crucify Him. Crucify him. Crucify him. It'll be the minority. Only one third that enters into the tribulation period of the Jews on this earth. One third will come out <coughs> with their house built on rock. And they'll be that nation born in the day. And what a glorious day that will be. Amen. 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 How this little study for a couple of services has helped you to see, and, and especially to see this, the importance of putting Scripture in its right place. Yeah. Okay? Now, for correction and for instruction in righteousness, we know all this stuff about false prophets and false teachers. We know that. We've got that crowd in the world today. We've got that crowd to contend with concerning the church. But this isn't talking about the church. It's talking about Israel yeah. and those Jews and the kingdom of heaven. And thank God one day that kingdom will come. Amen. Amen. Let's stand your feet tonight. Those chapters I gave you in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 on that verse really are to sometime before the weekend. Uh, you are to look over. 
and just see exactly what God's going to do to that, that false king, the Antichrist. Amen. What a glorious day that will be as well. I don't like pretenders. Yeah. And that's what he is. What he's going to be is a pretender. Amen.